All right, we are going to look at Psalm 125. My plan is to just look at the first two verses tonight and then to consider the whole psalm uh, next week, Lord willing. And so if you'd like, you can turn in your Bible or look up here at the slide, Psalm 125. This is verses uh, 1 and 2. It says, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people from this time forth and forever. And so in this psalm, um, we have really the main thrust of this idea of trusting in the Lord and us being like a mountain when we do that, first of all in the picture, and then the mountain surrounding Jerusalem is another picture of the Lord protecting us. So I think on one hand you see stability because we're like a mountain, and on the other hand the mountains are surrounding us so you see the Lord's protection. So you have stability on one hand and safety on the other hand. I think that that's the two main uh, points in, in the psalm. But let me begin with this. Just an observation. There are things that you cannot know about me tonight. One of the things that you cannot know is whether or not I'm trusting in the Lord, right? You say, well, obviously you're trusting in the Lord. You're preaching a message on, on trusting in the Lord. Well, I am. I'm trusting in the Lord, and I prayed about the message, and I'm depending upon Him to help me to communicate it. But you can't know that for sure about me, right? Isn't that true? You can have an inkling, maybe, or you can be concerned about me spiritually. You might see uh, me in an unguarded moment, and you might think to yourself, you know, maybe he's duplicitous. Maybe he isn't trusting in the Lord, right? But you can't know that for sure, and I can't know that about you. You can't know whether I'm trusting in the Lord as I give the word of God to you, and I can't know whether you're trusting in the Lord as you receive it. Who is the one person that does know? Well, it's the Lord himself. He knows us inside and out. Hebrews 4 verses 12 and 13 say that the word of God is quick, it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. But when we often leave verse 13 off, which, think, which tells us very clearly that everything is open for God, Nobody's hidden from him. There is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open before the one to whom we must give an account. He is going to judge us for the way that we live our lives. And he knows whether or not we're trusting in him tonight or whether or not we were trusting in him as we went through our day uh, today or even yesterday. He knows if we're trusting in him. If you and I are trusting in the Lord... And, and I am, as best as I know, trusting in the Lord, and you're trusting in the Lord as you receive uh, the word of God tonight, then you can be assured of something, that we have something special going on here. Because as we depend upon the word of God and the Lord giving us the word of God tonight, then we have something that other people, even though they know God exists, don't have, right? Take, for example, creatures who have been... Created by God, they know that God exists, but they don't have the same promises that you and I have, right? You think about the demons in James chapter 2. They believe that God is one, but yet they tremble. They tremble not in the godly fear sense. They tremble because they know what's coming to them. Now, that's not true of you and me. They don't possess what you and I possess. We possess the promises of God, and that makes all the difference in the world. So in other words, the object of our trust is God himself, but then he has fleshed out this trust so that we know exactly what he is willing to give us in his word. It's just whether or not we believe that he will provide those things for us. Or maybe we won't wait on him. We, we talk about wait and trust together because they're important concepts together. We, we won't wait on him. We'll rush off ahead of him. And as we rush off ahead, we get ourselves into trouble uh, because he was going to answer our prayer, but we've gone ahead of him 
and we've chosen a way that he will not bless or that he will not honor because he's not looking for us to glorify ourselves. He's looking to be glorified by us. And so we commit our way to the Lord. Every concern, every twinge of guilt, every difficulty that we face, every pain that we experience, we're trusting in him. It's almost as if we take all of those things and we ball them up like a load of laundry and we cast them upon the Lord. Say, this is it, right? I'm casting my burden upon you and I know that you will sustain me. Um, the desires that I have, the, 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 the things that I think that are needs in my life, I have to check all of those things against God's word and trust in what he reveals about those things. Maybe they are wants and they're not needs and he will let me know that, but I can't know that if I'm not, if I'm not trusting in him. Now, if I am trusting in him, then I should have great expectations, right? In other words, I think as we trust in the Lord, then our expectations of what he can do enlarge because we see him answering our prayers and then as we expand those expectations, he, do, he does even greater things, greater works for us. And that's because of our trust in him. And the more that that happens and the more expansive all of this gets, the more we see the stability and the safety that he promises us in Psalm 125. So let's look at that first point, the idea of stability. It says we are like Mount Zion when we trust in the Lord, in that we cannot be moved. That's what the text says. That reminds me of maybe the New Testament equivalent in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, which says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain, it's not empty, when it is accomplished in the Lord. Your labor can be empty. When is your labor empty? When you're not in the Lord. You say, well, that's impossible for a Christian. Well, not in this context, you know, we are in the Lord in that we are saved and we're kept by him. But if we, you know, he, he is always there for us. But if we decide to do things on our own, we can do that. And when we do, then our, our, we're just kind of spinning our wheels. The life that we live is vain. It, it doesn't have purpose. It's not useful for the Lord and for his service. Jesus spoke to Peter in Matthew 16 because I think, and you know people argue about this text, but I think he was speaking to Peter as a spokesman to all the other apostles. In other words, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, on you I'm going to build my church. But what he meant by that is, I'm going to build it on you and the other 11. I'm going to take you and I'm going to teach you and I'm going to give you the doctrine that you're going to need. And he didn't even give it all to them while he was living. He would give it to them through his spirit and through the inspiration of scripture. And so he, he is saying to Peter, on this apostolic structure, this of which I am the chief cornerstone, there can only be one. That's the Lord Jesus himself. That means that all of it falls apart without him. He said, on that foundation, I'm going to build my church. And he's very confident with that, and it's a promise. He's saying, I will build it. You say, well, what about all of these churches that fail? They open up their doors, and then they close them almost as soon as they open them. Or, or even all the churches that seem to be closing as we see America move away from God in our world today. That doesn't affect what Jesus is doing one bit. Nations fail God, certainly. Uh, local churches fail God, that's true. But he's still building his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Because it's a structure that will stand the test of time. It shall abide forever. We shall not be moved, it says in Psalm 125. Now, verse 2 of our text says that the mountains surround Jerusalem. Even so, the Lord surrounds his people from that time forward, even forever, it says. So he not only provides stability, but, but secondly, he provides safety. Now, you probably know from studying your Bible that Jerusalem was a well-fortified city even before it belonged to Israel. It belonged to a wicked group of people called the Jebusites, and it took David's, you know, the Lord and the Lord's strength to overwhelm Jerusalem and to take it for himself. Uh, we learn about that in 2 Samuel. But Jerusalem 
even though it was well fortified, and David, David, even though he was able to overwhelm it and take it for himself, and even though the Romans were able to overwhelm it and, and, and to raise it to the ground, to burn it to the ground, um, even though those things happen, if, if, if people would have continued to trust in the Lord, that city would have remained the apple of his eye. That's the point. It's not the geography that, that keeps Jerusalem safe in the Old Testament. It's the God uh, of Israel who keeps Jerusalem safe and keeps the temple safe. And that's true of us as well. Uh, we have a strong consolation. Uh, you know, we use that word differently today. It's a consolation prize. You know, well, we're talking about extreme comfort. We have strong consolation or comfort here because we fled for the refuge and we've laid hold of the hope that is before us and that refuge is Christ himself. Hebrews 6 calls him the anchor of the soul. It's the presence of our Savior, even Jesus knowing that he is with us. Nothing will separate us from his love, Paul says in Romans. And then in John tells us and reminds us that there is not anyone out there, even Satan himself, that can pluck us from his hand. He keeps us secure and he keeps us safe. So what do we do with all of this information as we pray? Well, the one thing that I think we need to do is to realize that we pray specifically for, for the things that we have need of tonight and the things that other people have need of tonight. In other words, we just don't acknowledge the presence of God. And I think a lot of churches are doing that today. They're acknowledging the presence of God. They're acknowledging his person. Uh, they're, they're striving to worship him. But for them, to worship him is to not ask him for anything. It's just to acknowledge that presence. But that's not prayer. Prayer is asking and specifically zeroing in on the things that we have need of and understanding that the will of God needs to reign supreme in our lives. He delivered his people because they prayed for that deliverance. He supported them because they prayed for that support. He, he had mercy upon them when they should have been judged and utterly decimated by the enemy when he delivered them many, many times, like the 186,000 Assyrians who were camped around the city. God struck them all dead in an evening, and all of a sudden, their problems were done. They were busy in the city eating one another. That's how destitute it was. They were, burning, uh, they were burning for energy or for light the feces from animals. That's what the scripture tells us. And yet the two lepers go out and what do they see before them? This banquet of food left by the enemy and all of the treasures that they left behind because uh, of the fear of the Lord being, uh, coming upon them. So... I think that when we, we look at stories like that, we need to understand that God will do the same thing for us. He will support us. He will keep us safe. He will make us like a mountain so that we will not be moved. But our part is to trust in him. And as we trust in him, we'll attempt great things for him. And as we attempt great things for him, as the writer said, we'll expect greater things from him. That's how the Christian life is supposed to work. The Lord shall make a table for us, even in the midst of our enemies. He will set it before us. That's what Psalm 23 is about, the Lord caring for us and take, uh, taking us uh, in, into pleasant places and leading us beside still waters. That's what the Lord will do. He will fulfill, it says in Psalm 145 and 19, he says he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. And so we are not limited when we trust in this limitless, sustaining God. He will provide for us. So let me just finish with this. Let's not waver at, at the promise of God through unbelief, as Paul said in Romans chapter 4 when he spoke of Abraham and his good example. Let, let's ask God and, and be strengthened by by faith tonight, let's give glory to God and be fully convinced that what he has promised in his word, he's able to deliver on that promise. He's able to provide for us. Be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication and, uh, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard, it will garrison your heart. It will protect it. 
um, heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Cast your anxieties and cares upon him because he cares for you. Blessed is the man, it says in Psalm 84, verse 12, who trusts in the Lord. So look at Psalm 125, uh, verses 1 and 2, maybe throughout this week, and ask the Lord to help you to trust in him more. Not just at certain times during the day, but all through the day, that we would trust in him. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Let's pray to you.